Good evening and welcome to a special edition of the Catholic Defender Radio Show. Tonight with your host Don Hartley, the Catholic Defender, we will examine in depth the truths of our faith and why we believe them. Tonight, Don Hartley's guest host is Dr. Gregory Thompson, an expert on many of the Eucharistic miracles proving the real presence of Jesus in the consecrated host. Tonight, Dr. Thompson will lead an in-depth examination of one of these Eucharistic miracles. Here now is Dr. Thompson. And ladies and gentlemen, this is Donald Hartley, known as the Catholic Defender. And I'm getting ready to just give uh, Dr. Thompson a call, so we will have him here in just a minute. He should be answering the phone in just a moment here, ladies and gentlemen. He happens to be in Florida. Hello? Gregory, you there? Hey, Gregory. Hello. This is, uh, we, we, I'm on the back side of the, we've already played the, the introduction, so we are live on the air. And so i uh, just letting everybody know that you are in the great state of Florida. How are you doing tonight there, uh, Greg? Better than wonderful, Donald. Uh, and God bless everybody from around the world that tuned in tonight. And uh, do we have anybody else with us tonight, Donald? We got uh, Judy Alciator. She just uh, popped in, and it's great to see you there, Judy. How are you doing tonight <laughs> from the great state of Texas? Well, good evening, gentlemen. I'm happy to be here with you. Well, just to let you know that uh, tonight, uh, uh, ju- I mean, I kind of got a little bit uh, backtracked here, uh, sidetracked. Uh, I drove by our new house that uh, we have set up, and somebody stole off with, uh, stole my, uh, I have a brand new flag. It was an army Aww. flag and a pole that we went on the house and, a, you know, the, the, the holder that went on the, the, the porch. They stole the whole thing, and oh, I just happened to drive by there and noticed it, and I'm thinking, oh, my goodness. It was a brand-new flag, brand-new pole, and brand-new pole holder, nice and everything, and it was just sitting perfectly, you know, real pretty on my on my new home that we were getting, and somebody walked away with it. And I'm thinking, oh, oh. Uh, Donald, Donald, it was probably someone that was Democrat that wanted to convert in a patriot. <laughs> oh gosh! Yes. Greg, you're Ten Commandments. Greg, Greg, your yes. uh, phone is uh, your your phone. You're you're kind of breaking up. Uh, are, do you have your uh, speaker on, or are do you have your phone on? I try it on. Normally it works as fine. I'll try it off. Yeah, you're yeah you're uh, you're still breaking up there. Right. Are, are, can you hear that? Can you hear that way? Uh, can you hear him okay there, Judy? Yeah, he he's breaking up. Okay, try it again there, uh, Greg. Greg, you there? Well, he may. Yeah, he yeah he's he's going to try to he's going to try to call back in. Because that's what happens when you're dealing with whistles and bells and all these things, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you have yes. to deal with what's going on. Uh, but uh, hopefully he'll be calling back in or let me try to call him back. Let me see. And uh, that's the beautiful thing about it is it could be a bad line. So I see where he dropped off. And then we'll make sure he's – Greg, is is that any better? Try it again. It was. It's been good on my side. I, it's whatever you all hear. Well, that well you sound okay. all right right now. Yeah, okay. that sounded a lot better. Yeah, that sounded a lot better. Well, anyway, as I was saying a while ago, just to let everyone know that, uh, uh, you know, someone stole my flag and my flagpole. My flagpole holder, oh, my goodness, ball, three of them were brand spanking new. So, but anyway, that's just, uh, it's kind of wonderful. I mean, we we just moved it. We're moving in there. We got uh, the movers coming in on Wednesday, and they're coming to get our piano on Tuesday, tomorrow. And so we're getting all these things all done today as far as 
getting the inter- uh, the uh, internet and getting the cable and all these other things all squared away. So we're able to come in tonight. Uh, I'm excited about that because we have a great Eucharistic miracle that uh, Greg had mm-hmm. <clears throat> sent for us to to uh, examine tonight. So, Greg, are you in front of a computer right now? I am. Okay. We'll and Judy, to, do you want to... Whenever we get to the point, when we get to the point, I will do the first two uh, paragraphs, and then uh, we'll let Judy start in the Eucharistic miracle. That sounds excellent. That sounds excellent. And uh, because of uh, the uh, beginning of this, why don't you go ahead and uh, lead that off, uh, Greg, the first two paragraphs? And uh, Judy, do you do have a copy of the show notes? Yes, I do. Outstanding. All right. Go for it, Greg. Uh Uh-oh. Oh, Oh, Greg, you're breaking up again. Yeah, you you were breaking up right there. Okay. Um, Well, there you go. All right. Are you ready? Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. It may be just the way you're tilting your head, maybe. (laughs) It, it was. I, I tilted it to the left, and it does that all the time. I tilt it to the left. Okay. That's uh, what happens. That's what happens there, Greg. You're not – see, you're supposed to be on the right, you know. You can't be on the left. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Starting out, this is just some thoughts for, the, for those that get these Eucharistic miracles to really uh, I give them some insight to uh, – you know, what are you Christian miracles? Throughout the history of the Catholic Church, Jesus has proven beyond any doubt that he is truly present in the Holy Eucharist. Why did he have to prove this to us? It is because at certain times in history there were heresies that denied the real presence in the sacrament of the Holy Eucharist. On other occasions, some priests doubted the real presence of Jesus in the Holy Eucharist, and yet on other occasions, The Holy Eucharist was abused by believers and non-believers alike. What follows tonight is one of over 100 Eucharistic miracles that took place throughout the centuries in the history of the Catholic Church. All of them have received the full approval of the Catholic Church. Please share. I want to repeat that. Please share. And then seek the next one and share. And continue to show your love in a special way to our Lord by giving all your family and friends and those that are put into your path an opportunity to strengthen their faith. This glorifies the good Lord and brings some into and some back to the Catholic Church. We're in a battle right now, and, uh, you know, for souls, that's the highest law of the church. Is salvation of souls, and this is one thing, one of the things. Uh, in fact, it's the most important thing uh, in the church. It's, it's a heightened summit of the church is the Eucharist itself. And uh, so, when we have an opportunity to share these things to open people's eyes, and if their eyes, if they feel they're already open, it's just an opportunity to strengthen their faith. And so that's what we're trying to be about with these. So, Donald, God bless you. And uh, I wish your voice was as pretty as uh, Judy's. We got to read some. <laughs> but, uh, so. I can't, I can't so, uh, argue with you there. You, you're right on the mark right there. Judy's got that, uh, she's got that Italian type of accent and voice and everything that uh, not only can she read, ladies and gentlemen, she could also sing. I've actually had a chance to hear her sing a little bit anyway. That's cool stuff. All right. All right. Well, then, uh, Judy, you have it from here. Go for it. Okay. The Eucharistic Miracle of Ivora, Spain, ten ten. The parish priest of this town doubted the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist One day in the year 1010, while celebrating Mass, the miracle occurred. 
the wine contained in the chalice was converted entirely into live blood. At present, the sacred relics are preserved in a Gothic reliquary from 1426 that contains the altar cloth spotted with blood and other relics given from Pope Sergius IV to St. Ermengol. The heretical doctrines that denied the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist began to spread throughout all of Europe in the 11th century. The priest of Evora, Bernat Oliver, also doubted the reality of transubstantiation. While he celebrated Mass, a miracle suddenly occurred. The wine in the chalice was converted into blood and poured onto the altar cloth flowing onto the ground. The Bishop of Ergel, St. Ermengal, informed of what happened, was immediately brought to Evora to confirm the facts in person, which were then reported directly to Pope Sergius IV in Rome. He then signed a pontifical bull in which it was certified that a true miracle occurred. The relics of the miracle and the pontifical document were placed under the high altar of the parochial church of Evora, titled to San Cugat, and inaugurated in the year 1055. At present, the sacred relics are preserved in the Gothic reliquary from 1426 that contains the altar cloth stained with blood and other relics given from Pope Sergius IV to St. Ermengal. In 1663, to satisfy the requirements of the great number of pilgrims that went to venerate the miracle every year, the present sanctuary was built. Even today, after all of these years, on the second Sunday of Easter, an important feast is celebrated, known by the name La Santa Duda, in reference to the doubt of Bernat Oliver, the priest of Evora, and the great miracle. Wow. You know, Judy, how many times have we seen this where because yeah. of the doubt of a priest, yeah. mm-hmm. uh, the Lord has given us such a miracle. And it's interesting because when you look at Acts chapter 20, uh, beginning with verse 28, listen to the words of this. Take heed to yourselves. He's talking to the church here. He's talking to the ministers. Take heed to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you guardians to feed the church of the Lord, which he obtained with his own blood. This is very Eucharistic uh, in what it's saying here. But take heed to yourselves and to all the flock. That's exactly what we see. Uh, we see that uh, in First Peter chapter 5. Uh, where St. Peter is saying essentially, saying basically the same thing. I think that's interesting to say. It says there, it says, uh, this is First Peter chapter 5, beginning with verse 1, So I exhort the elders, that is the, the shepherds, among you as a fellow shepherd and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is to be revealed, here you go. Tend the flock of God that is in your charge, not by constraint but willingly, not for shameful gain but eagerly, not as domineering over those in your charge but being examples to the flock. So you see uh, St. Uh, Peter echoing what St. Paul says here, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock. And what does both of these have in common? Because that's exactly what Jesus tells Peter. You go to uh, John, the Gospel of John, chapter 21, and you see where Jesus is taking Peter to the side and saying, Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, I love you. Tend my sheep. 
Three times he said that. Do you love me? Tend my sheep. Feed my sheep. Take care of my sheep. That's basically, I mean, you know, you see this by St. Paul and St. Peter echoing what Jesus commanded. And that's what the bishops are to do today. And these Eucharistic miracles, oh, I love this. Again, this is verse 28. Take heed to yourselves and to all the flock. That's the church in which the Holy Spirit has made you guardians. Every Catholic priest is in this description. To feed the church of the Lord. Think about that. To feed the, <laughs> what do we feed the, the, the people with? The Eucharist, the Eucharist, the Word of God. Of yeah, That's the right. Eucharist, the Word of God. Right. Exactly. To feed the church of the Lord, which he obtained with his own blood. And may I add, not only did he obtain with his own blood, but he nourishes us with it. He washes us with it, his blood. That's how important his blood is. And when you have a miracle like tonight... <laughs> Think about this. While he was celebrating Mass, a miracle suddenly occurred. The wine in the chalice was converted, transformed, not only the substance, but also the appearance. That's huge. Donald? That the wine in the... Yes. I'm, I'm just wondering, um, get your insight on this, or, or maybe Greg's insight as well. These, these doubts that some of these priests have had... Um, over time, I wonder what it is they're actually doubting. Could it possibly be that they doubt their own uh, power, their own Christ-given authority to create that miracle? Yeah, I don't either know. Way, that, go ahead, go ahead, Greg. I just say either way. Uh, you know, if they go so far as to doubt that, they do doubt the uh, real presence, because uh, as a matter of fact, they doubted it because they don't feel like they have the capability of uh, of uh, to work through them, you know, for that uh, yeah. uh, to happen during, during the Mass. So either way, there is a, a doubt in the real presence. Mm-hmm. Being there, you know. So there's something there's something more to it also, I think. You have to look at the the environment, like the times that we're living in today. I think many of our priests are subject subjected to the environment that we have today, and just like we have today, back in those days, you could see there was a lot of uh, doubt throughout the entire uh, European world. It says, in fact. The parish priest in this town doubted the real presence of Christ, but he was a product of the time. And so there was a lot of doubt among the people because you had certain heresies. In fact, it says the heretical doctrines that denied the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist began to spread throughout all of Europe in the 11th century. And so when you look at it from that perspective, if you count back to the 11th century, you know, Greg and I, and you too, Judy, we've been talking a lot of these Eucharistic miracles that happened from the 11th, 12th, 13th, 14th centuries. It seems like there's a lot of them that did take place to counter. The Lord counters these these things through his truth. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by through me. And because of these heretical doctrines, the Lord, to save his people, gives us such signs, and it says that in Acts chapter 2, beginning with uh, 17 and 18 and 19, verses 17, 18, 19, he says that in the last times it would pour out his spirit upon all flesh. Your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams, and these the handmaids of the Lord shall prophesy, and it would perform wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below. And so when we see these Eucharistic miracles, these signs, which I think this is very interesting because when you go to the Gospel of John, chapter 6, verse 30, the people asked him, what sign can you give us <laughs> that we should follow you? And Jesus then gives us the bread of life discourse in John, chapter 6. So this sign that uh, they're asking for, he continues to give us through these miracles that have happened throughout the uh, 
history of the church. Oh, this is really cool stuff. I, I have another question. <laughs> this is really cool. I have another Go for question. It. Okay. Um, it seems to me that um, when when the Hebrews were given uh, manna from heaven, when they were walking, uh, you know, journeying through the desert, that that was a, uh, at least some sort of a precursor to the Eucharist. Yes, no, maybe so. Oh, most certainly. In fact, Jesus refers to that in that uh, uh, John 6 Bread of Life discourse. I mean, it's interesting how you brought that in there because you have what we call uh, in the Old Testament, there's a lot of opportunities or situations where uh, an event happens in the Old Testament, but it is in, it's a rela- it relates to uh, what's going to happen in the future. And I like what you just said. You go to uh, uh, John chapter 6, and the Jews began to murmur what Jesus said because Jesus, <laughs> he told them that uh, he is the bread. He says, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall not hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. That's what Jesus is telling them. And then the Jews began to murmur at him and and because of this, he says, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother uh, we know? How does he now say, I have come down from heaven? And so Jesus, basically, he gets in there, and that's where he talks about, you go down to uh, verse 48. He says, I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread which comes down from heaven, that a man may eat of it and not die. And Greg, we know that what he's talking about there is spiritual, that when Amen. a person Amen. dies, yeah, he, he, did send, the person, he did send a trait, too, that, you know, when they were saying Moses uh, brought us manna, uh, he told them, he said, uh, Moses didn't do that. You know, my father in heaven did that. You know, you exactly. had manna because he, yeah. he brought that to you. Yeah. So, uh, hey. all right. Yeah, this this is, uh, you know, like you said, we, we've had different ones where, where a priest doubted. And uh, I think it's, uh, you know, uh, it's a, uh, you know, almost, almost as good as a blind test really is. Uh, from scientists, you know, where you have someone that is, a, you know, in some way uh, has doubted the presence or is skeptical or something, and the good Lord uh, bringing forth a miracle for people to see and, and venerate, you bet. And uh, so uh, I, I thought it was... That was pretty neat, the, this quote, too. We'll go ahead and uh, do the quote, if it's all right, uh, sure. from St. Athanasius. St. Saint, Saint Athanasius, uh, he was uh, from Alexandria. He ended up being the bishop of Alexandria. Uh, that's the doctor of the church that actually put the scripture together, as we have it today in the New Testament. And, uh, of course, he was working with Septuagint, so the Holy Spirit... Uh, made sure uh, that stayed in the uh, scripture until until uh, Martin Luther took it out again after the anti-Christian Jews did, did in 90 AD. But uh, anyway, uh, St. Ignatius, he was born in Alexandria and uh, was ordained a deacon in 319. And he accompanied uh, his bishop, Alexander, to the Council of Nicaea, where he served as his secretary. Eventually, that's that's interesting right there also, because uh, the first time what he put together in 367, the first time that was looked at by a council, was in Rome under Pope Damasus in 382. And uh, there was another doctor of the church, St. Jerome, who was the secretary of that council. So it's interesting that there's two of the uh, early doctors of the church were secretaries of uh, very important councils. And 
what was so important about Nicaea was the, uh, you know, the fact that there was an Arian heresy uh, going uh, very strongly at that time, and probably more uh, more of our clergy at that time, uh, you know, were drawn in by that. Uh, and uh, uh, Saint uh, Athanasius was one of the defenders against the Arian heresy, and they, they call it Arian heresy because of the uh, a priest that was named Arius, who actually taught that Jesus could not have entered, existed eternally as God prior to his historical incarnation as a man. And according to Arius, Jesus was the highest of created beings and could be considered divine only by analogy. Arians professed a belief in Jesus, Jesus' divinity, but meant only that he was God's greatest preacher. Now that's, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's what he was fighting against, you know, like, like some of the things we fight against today, you know. But uh, in his sermon, uh, to the newly baptized, he says this, You shall see the Levites bringing loaves and a cup of wine and placing them on the table. So long as the prayers of supplication and entreaties have not been made, there is only bread and wine, just as it is today. But after the great and wonderful prayers have been completed, then the bread has become the body and the wine, the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then again, he says, let us approach the celebration of the mysteries. This bread and this wine, so long as the prayers and supplications have not taken place, remain simply what they are. But after the great prayers and holy supplications have been sent forth, the word comes down into the bread and wine, and thus his body is confected. So, what has happened is the uh, the priest we spoke about tonight that he has he has the uh, been ordained <clears throat> and he had a disbelief but even though he had a disbelief didn't affect the fact that he did the prayers of ordained of an ordained priest and so it it turned in uh, to his body and, and blood, and, and they actually had a miraculous happening as a result of that for the people to see. And uh, well, we we are blessed today. Just think about you know, all the different strengths in your face. Craig, you're you're mm-hmm. breaking. You just started breaking up again. What was that last piece that you were trying to say? Is that better now? I think that was. Can you hear me now? There. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, I can't remember what I said no. now. <laughs> Distraction. Sorry <laughs> about that. Oh, no, that's okay. That's okay. That's what we deal with. Uh, I know that up here where I'm at, uh, we're getting a little bit of uh, weather, uh, snow and ice and all this kind of – well, it's been that kind of a cold day today. I know that uh, where uh, Judy is down there in Texas, if it gets down to 70, that's kind of like a cold front, ain't it? <laughs> I remember. Oh, that's funny. And so you're down in Florida, and if it gets down to 80, that's a cold front. So I know you both kind of escaped that. But I like what you were getting to when you were talking about uh, the priest was ordained, and his ordination and his uh, offering the mass uh, was valid, very important. And this is what uh, St. Paul writes to Timothy. This is uh, chapter 4, beginning with verse 6. He says, and he's speaking to all priests, by the way, all b- bishops and priests. St. Paul is speaking to all the clergy here. If you put these instructions before the brethren, that is the church, you will be a good minister of Christ Jesus, nourished on the words of the faith and of the good doctrine which you have followed. 
Have nothing to do with godless and silly myths. Train yourself in godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, which that's good for me because I was an athlete most of my life, godliness is of value in every way as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. Thus saying this, the, the saying is true, uh, well, the saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance, for to this end we toil and strive, because we have our hope set on the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of those who believe. So this is what St. Paul says, command and teach these things, that no one despise your youth, but set the believers an example in speech and conduct, in love, in faith, and purity, till I come attend to the public readings of Scripture. Man, that's, that's the first part of the Mass, isn't it? To preaching, to teaching. Do not neglect the gift you have which was given you by prophetic utterance when the elders, the shepherds, laid their hands upon you. Practice these duties. Devote yourself to them so that all may see your progress. And this is important right here. Take heed to yourself and to your teaching. Hold to that, for by doing so, you will save both yourself and your hearers. And so that's exactly what uh, Greg was alluding to, that when a priest is ordained, it doesn't, I mean, I mean, it's important that, you know, he's doing it with conviction. That's what St. Paul is saying here. But unfortunately, sometimes they do have doubt, like the priest we have here tonight. But his doubt did not prevent the Lord from doing his work through him. And through his work, he was able to show the priest the error, or at least he was able to, to compensate against that doubt. I mean, when you see a miracle like that, it's, you know, thing is believing. Even for people in Missouri, wouldn't you agree with that there, uh, Greg? <laughs> Missouri? <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, we, uh, I think uh, Missouri's motto <clears throat> has infected the whole country, really, and the world, as far as show me. Uh, everybody wants it proven to them today and uh, all the way around the world. And uh, thank God. And it doesn't come from us. All eternal things come from God. But thank God that he's given us an opportunity to have a supernatural faith, which which basically takes people saying yes. Because God, he doesn't want, he doesn't want to leave anybody out, but they have to say yes, and he's not going to force them. He wants them to do it for the right reason and out of love, because that's what he's first given us is his love. And so, uh, you know, I have uh, many friends around the world, hopefully, that are listening tonight, but uh, that you've been given the grace to have, uh, to say yes to a supernatural faith in the Eucharist, like uh, my uh, brother and sister in Christ, uh, Donald and Judy, here tonight, you know, to have that. And uh, that's not kept away from others. It's, It's a matter of, of saying yes to God and doing things his way. And he will not leave anyone orphan. He will bring you the truth. And uh, the uh, truth exists. If you're not there yet, if you've fallen away, or if you need to come back to the Catholic Church, that's the only place where the fullness of truth does exist. Uh, And uh, so no matter where you are in your walk, come back. The gain in strength, and uh, I know these Eucharistic miracles can help you, and our Lord wants that, uh, knowing how we're always in a prove-it-to-me mode, and what, what can you show me? Can you show me a miracle? And uh, he's been doing that uh, for centuries, you know, since, two th- since 33 AD. He's been giving us miracles to help us grow in our faith. And, uh, you know, I'm I'm blessed by the, who we surround ourselves with, who we have as our counselors. And, uh, you know, Judy and, and Donald uh, have been a special gift, I know, to my life and many others. So uh, while, I'm, while I'm thinking about it, because uh, they have, both have different gifts, and we don't do this on our radio, on the radio waves, uh, blog talk radio waves around the world, 
uh, without Donald's effort to make it, putting it together. And I appreciate that so much, Donald. That's a, that was an answer to a prayer, you know. And uh, then uh, also to have a, a very talented, uh, strong Catholic, uh, uh, and I don't want to misquote uh, who has a, uh, a, a Facebook page, I think, Why, why We're Catholic, or uh, what is it, Judy? Why I Am a True Catholic. Why am I? Why I am a true Catholic? I mean, you want to get the whole thing in there because uh, yeah. you know I know there's some others that are fairly close, but uh, Judy is uh, so strong uh, with uh, with the theology of the Church in her uh, Facebook page that I think would uh, bless those that have an opportunity uh, to go in there and why I am a true Catholic and and, and help them. Uh, because we can we can find different uh, venues that can help us grow in our faith, you know. And uh, so we I think you'll see. We have such a beautiful that... faith, Greg. We have such a beautiful faith. I mean, really, if you think about it, all the all the blessings that that the Lord has given us through our Catholic faith, the the beauty of it, the great love from God that manifests in our faith it's just it's the greatest gift we could have here on this earth Amen to that and, and the the promise that we have Hebrews chapter 11 beginning with verse 1 now faith is the assurance of things hoped for the conviction of things not seen for by it the men of old received divine approval by faith we Understand that the world was created by the word of God so that what is seen was made out of things which do not appear. It's kind of an example to the Eucharist, too, because when you see the Eucharist, what you ordinarily see is just simple bread, unleavened bread that is being used in the (coughs) consecration. And and that's that's the perception. That's the, you know, our senses. That's what we see. But yet, when we have the eyes of faith behind that, we know what the Lord says. This is what the covenant is made based from in the New Testament, the new and everlasting covenant. That is so important for us to to see that with the eyes of faith. Because when you do, it opens it up to a clear and more personal relationship with the Lord. People want that relationship. People strive for that relationship. They seek it, but many times they fall into all these different rabbit trails. There's so many different uh, uh, voices out there trying to to, uh, take your attention off of who he is. That's the thing. It's like Peter. We can Go ahead. I I was just going to add to that, you know, you know, we can, you know, I've said many times to uh, thousands of people now that, uh, you know, I ask them, are you more holy than Peter or, you know, as one of the apostles? And somebody who saw all the things that he did with Jesus raising people the dead, uh, all those different things uh, that he saw in miraculous happenings. And, uh, of course, they, they aren't going to say they're more holy than he is, for sure. And I said, and yet he denied Christ three times, you know, because he was in his flesh at the time. You know, had he been in, the, had he been, had he been in the, with the Holy Spirit, he could have stood. But every one of us, you know, out there in the pews, without a strength of the Holy Spirit in their flesh, there are going to be people that have those doubts or, or fall away or different things at different times, and. And for us to think that a priest is more human, you know, you know, he's he's in the flesh. We've seen that many times in the last uh, few decades, where priests have uh, fallen because they've fallen by their flesh, and uh, so uh, you yeah. know, and so just 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 yes. So just to emphasize the beautiful gift of grace that the good Lord has given us because 
we didn't. It didn't happen because we're smart. It <laughs> happened because yeah. we said yes to an infinite holy God, and and He gave us that what you what you call supernatural faith. But He also is very aware how weak people are in the flesh. So He to to help us with that. What happens like tonight with you guys? is that we offer things that he, miracles that he says, guys, I'm still here, I'm with you. And this is, you know, he's given us these miracles over the ages, over the centuries, uh, so that we can help the weakness of people's flesh. You know, and, and they still have to say yes to the supernatural aspect of things, for sure. It, that has come from a personal uh, decision that is not forced upon them. God will not mess with their free will. But when they when they open their eyes, and they're open their eyes because they are seeking the Lord. They're wanting to know the truth. Lord, help me. And He gives gives them these things and say, "Hey, my child, here here look look at this, and you will see me." And uh, how much how much we need that in our walk as human beings for that to happen uh, to to strengthen what we what we should already believe and uh, it just helps and it helps in our evangelization to others you know it strengthens us in our own walk so that we can help strengthen other people in their walk to eternity and so uh, anyway. Uh, Judy, do you have a uh, poem for tonight? Well, uh, yes, I do. Um, <clears throat> since today is Veterans Day, uh-huh. <clears throat> the Lord had given me this poem um, some time ago, and uh, <clears throat> it's all about <clears throat> what uh, what they face. And I had entitled it "Battle Scarred." Off to battle, they bravely marched. Greeted by songs and cheers. It didn't take long for the terror to change the songs to myriad tears. Through the fray, they carried on, facing the enemy guns. To a man, though death surround, not a one would run. Weary now, the battle's o'er, trudging through their grief. Recalling friends whose eyes are closed, lives so sweet, so brief. Living lives with families who must not see the pain. For speaking of those days gone by brings back the shock again. So smile, be brave as you were then. More battles to be won as children grow and loved ones leave. Salute your valiant sons, who now will face the terror of the killing fields today, returning some in boxes closed, lost in the battle's fray. Age it all, those who remain drink toasts to absent friends, and pray the day will soon be here when battles see their end. Oh, that's beautiful. Amen to that. Kind of rem- Amen to that. And I have one of the last... day to both of you. Thank you for your service to your country and to all our listeners who happen to be veterans. Thank you all so, so very much. We know that freedom is not free, and there are many, many who have paid the ultimate cost for the freedom we enjoy in this country. Amen oh, to that. Amen and to, and let me, let me. I want to clear something up for future. Uh, Donald is definitely a veteran and uh, one of my best friends, and I appreciate him. And I've, I felt uh, your words around him whenever uh, you were saying that poem, Judy. Uh, I was actually an ROTC uh, because I was going to go in as an officer. Uh, That's how Paul my, did. It. <laughs> and and then uh, I had uh, they started I had my second daughter on the way they started pulling out of Vietnam 
Yeah. Uh, the year I gra- the year I graduated, so I ended mm-hmm. up uh, not having to uh, serve over there. Uh, but uh, oh, but you would have. You would. Well, have. yeah, I well, would. You're a veteran would. in your heart. <laughs> well, for sure on that. For sure on that. <laughs> but uh, but yeah. Yes, I remember so, when when President Nixon were calling was calling the the boys home because um, our daughter was a baby. And I was sitting up, she was kind of colicky, and I was sitting up uh, with her, trying to get her to sleep, watching the late news. And um, they made the announcement that uh, President Nixon was calling the boys home from Vietnam. And my husband came home a month early because of that. And in spite of everything that we've heard about President Nixon, he'll always have a place in my heart. Because his his doing that um, maybe saved my husband's life. And he came home to us, to, to, to me, to our two children, to all of his uh, family, his, his parents and, and brothers and all those who love him. And uh, the day he, he walked off that airplane, I'll tell you, <laughs> it, it was... All I could say was, you know, thank you, dear Lord. Thank you, dear Lord. Amen to that. Amen that's, to that. That's definitely special. My platoon motto uh, was grave robbers. And uh, I instructed, you know, I, I was I put this heavy on my soldiers. You know, every soldier that we save uh, from the combat medics, every soldier that we save, that's the family that we're bringing that soldier back home to. Yeah, it was right. a very important part of what we're about, uh, and that's what I was, a combat medic. And so uh, the opportunity that I've had in uh, bringing the faith out there to a war zone or even out in a field environment uh, yeah. is just a, some of the greatest uh, graces I've, I've been able to receive. And yeah. I've, I've received it all. I've seen it all. I've I've had soldiers die in my hands, and the, the only thing that I could actually do in the absence of a priest would be to uh, uh, offer the divine mercy. That would be the only thing. I, in certain situations, that's all you could do. And so yeah. uh, the, the, the greatest sacrifice that some of us make is the whole, the, the full sacrifice yeah. where they offer it all. And so I like to remember them too. Uh, veterans Day, you know, we recognize all the veterans, but some of families. us didn't come home. Yeah, and the, the families, families of the veterans. Because yeah. when, when when our loved ones are away, uh, facing the danger of of war, it, it, we're kind of going through it too. Uh, I remember how I felt, and. Um, Talking to other wives whose whose husbands were also in Vietnam at that time, uh, the shared fears and and sorrows, and uh, some of us were pregnant as I was, and um, you just you know you don't know. There's that uncertainty: uh, is he going to come home? Uh, will he be the same if he does come home? Because not every not every person who goes to war comes back the same. We know that. As a medic, you probably faced a lot of that, uh, Donna. We uh, do. What it can do, do to, you, to a person psychologically. Well, that when you just said that, uh, just reminded me of. Uh, uh, I don't know if you saw it. Uh, we were soldiers with Mel Gibson. Yes. Yeah, and where uh, his wife and another uh, young lady, mothers, uh, in fact, the other young lady was pregnant, but they were taking the uh, messages to the different ones when their husband was killed in battle, uh-huh. which is, was extremely tough, but it was just... Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, just made me think about what you were saying, Judy. And, uh, yeah. And, uh... Oh, yes. <laughs> well, I remember going to uh, one of the meetings of this organization I had joined, uh, the Waiting Wives. 
And, uh, of course, the main topic of conversation was always, you know, our husbands who were in Vietnam. And one of the wives mentioned that um, one one of the other women that she knew after they they were together for their R and R, her husband went back, and uh, he he was killed. You know, it, it just oh. that R and R was the last time they they had together here on this earth, and um, <laughs> it, it it's a frightening thing. But faith in God is the only thing that gets you through it. Faith in God. It is that that is, and you never know. Uh, when you're under fire out outside the wire, uh, when I was in Iraq, I formed what is called the Rosary Patrol, and yeah. through the Rosary Patrol, we were doing we were praying for our soldiers going outside the wire, which included us. Oftentimes, I was outside the wire a lot. I mean, we all were, most of us were. Some of you know, very very few of us, uh, especially leaders, uh, stayed. <laughs> No, we we were very much out there, but uh, we were able to pray the rosary and the divine mercy. That became a major uh, strength for me, and uh, Didn't you it became have some a major serious strength. Injuries, Donald. I had a mortar shell that hit behind me that yeah. uh, caused my third and fourth cervical disc to lodge into my spinal cord, and they had hmm. to go in there and fix that. It took them a while to discover it, actually, because they thought yeah. it was primarily. Uh, uh, they thought it was primarily muscular, and you didn't see it on a normal X-ray. It wasn't until mm-hmm. they did an MRI that they found that. They found yeah. it on a Thursday, and Saturday, the following Saturday morning, I was in an emergency <laughs> operation. Everything yeah. from my right foot all the way up to my face <clears throat> was uh, hot and numb. Uh, Greg, mm. when we spoke there in, uh, I don't think it was Boonville, it was the other one, the one that uh, at St. Mary's Catholic Church uh, where uh, uh-huh. we did the... Uh, Night the fire recently. Uh, when I gave that talk there, that's when I was having. Uh, uh, I mean, I had such pain in my neck. Before I spoke, I went there and I tried to relax and get my head tilted in such a way on it that it, uh, you know, I was able to give the talk. But I mean, that was a very tough time at that uh, in my life at that time because I. You know, I didn't know what the problem was, and I was—I I thought it was muscular mm-hmm. too, but it was—it was something that was far more than that. And and fortunately, they were able to uh, to uh, uh, find it and fix it. That's the big thing. Uh, I got titanium plate, titanium screws, and a part of my right hip bone, mm-hmm. and they took a, out my third cervical disc and put in a spacer in there, plastic spacer. Mm-hmm. But uh, what they did for me is what they did for Peyton Manning. <laughs> Peyton Manning got injured on the football field, uh, which almost ended his career. He was a, a, a cult, Indianapolis cult at the time, and it, it would have injured, it, it would have uh, uh, stopped his career. But because of this new form of what 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 they did for me, they did for him, and he ended up going to the Denver Broncos, winning four division championships, went to two Super Bowls, and won one. So. Now I, you know, that, that's something I can stand up for, and I, I can do myself. And you know, Greg, every time we do these ignite the fires and these conferences, <laughs> those are like Super Bowls, and that's like you know our victory. <laughs> you know. Uh, may may so. I ask for prayers uh, for for a certain uh, situation? You you guys have probably heard about the fires uh, raging in Australia. Uh, I yes. have a, a very good Facebook friend, uh, Rosalie. In fact, I've, I've sometimes read her poetry on uh, on the shows. And she lives down in Australia, and she has friends that are in that fire zone. And she's very concerned about them. She's offered them shelter if, you know, if they have to evacuate. So I'd like to ask our listeners to please offer a prayer for those in Australia who are in danger from these fires because they are really raging out of control. Uh, the latest update on it was that uh, they were expecting the fires to become what they call catastrophic. Already some people have died, some people are missing. Um, uh, over 150 homes have been destroyed. 
So please keep those people in your prayers. Thank you. Where is that at? I'm sorry? Where is that at? Uh, New South Wales, Australia. Okay. Yeah, those those are those are uh, happening all uh, our California. Oh yeah. Uh, sad fires. Yeah. Yep. And yep. so you know we had uh, mm-hmm. one of the people that we spoke. You know the, the the gentleman that played Hercules told us about his California fire that it came yeah. all the way to his. Front yard yeah. and it stopped. Yes, yes. It stopped. You know, it reminded me around. of one of the um, Marian uh, apparitions that uh, John talk, talk, told us about. Uh, the one that happened in, I think, in Wisconsin. With the with yeah, the, Wisconsin. Yeah, that that big Chicago fire and it 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 spread, and yeah. But the but that whole area where the Blessed Mother appeared. Not not so much as a blade of grass was touched. Yeah, Greg, you went there, didn't you? I've been been there twice. Yes, I uh, had to. I had to go back the second time to take somebody with me just to, just to be able to uh, be a part of it. It's just below Green Bay, Wisconsin. Yes. You know yeah. that that reminded me too because when Greg went up there. Uh, there was uh, a number of people who was surprised uh, with Greg being there. They they were trying to figure out who that was that uh, was with Greg, uh, because they it was actually Cardinal. Uh, uh, what was his name there, uh, uh, Greg? <laughs> you guys can Cardinal Burke. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Cardinal Burke. They were wanting to find out who is that with Greg. You know, everybody was wanting to know who that was with Greg. And so uh, it was. It was. We found out it was Cardinal Burke. Oh. So that's that's pretty cool stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and that would lead to a, an interview where Greg was able to interview uh, Cardinal Burke later on down the line. Uh, that was yeah. just uh, what, yeah. a, just a, some about a year ago now, and it, uh, Greg, something like that. Time goes by fast. Be, you're having fun. What a gift. Be a year. Be a year in January. Yes. Yeah, a year in January, so I knew it was coming close. It was, it's been some time now, but that that was that's all a blessing. That's all a blessing, and everything Absolutely. that we do. Hopefully, we can touch one person. If we can touch one person with all we do, it's all worth it. Yes, yes. Even the Amen. fact that someone would steal my flag and flagpole and my my. Well, you know uh, what? I mean, they they even stole the holder <laughs> too. Now that's that's low. You know, they, you know they what? Just say bowl. God bless them. Just say God bless them and give give them give them to God. Say a prayer for them and for their souls because <laughs> they need it. <laughs> they need those prayers. Wow. <laughs> wow. That's yeah. I, I couldn't I couldn't believe that. I drove by there. I was getting ready to come home. I was getting ready to just you know. I, I, all I had to do was just kind of sign on. And all of a sudden, I saw that, and and then I told my wife about it, and I, yeah, I was cranky. I mean, you know, that's something that I wasn't happy about. But uh, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm trying, well, you know, you we know. face these little tests in life. You know, um, going to war uh, when my son had his stroke, um, when illness hits hits a, a loved one. When death comes, um, when financial difficulties strike a family, you, you just never know what what life can throw at you. And all these little tests test our faith. They t- they truly do. They test our faith. We can use well, them that's... to grow in faith. We can. That's how we we should use them to grow in faith in God. There has to be a reason for these things that happen. Well, that's it. So uh, our response is is to try to be charitable and try to be humble. But sometimes you you, you, <laughs> you got to... Uh, See, there's boy. that flesh that y'all yeah. were talking about earlier. <laughs> well, that's where that... 
that's that's where that Hulk Hogan comes out. You know, <laughs> but yeah. Yeah, well, great. Jesus We're said it, the time. spirit is willing, but that flesh is weak. <laughs> there you go. And, I, I, and you know, the whole idea of St. Michael, you know, that uh, to be a warrior, um, yeah, we should right. do it in his name and not our own name. And, that, that's and sometimes right. that's not always easy. Yeah. You know, we, we that's strive. That's why we need to pray. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. But and Greg, what's the best we are prayer? at that time. What, wait, what's the best prayer uh, after the Mass? That rosary. Oh, the rosary. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's uh, a very powerful prayer and very uh, important for us. So, but Greg, we are at that time. Do you happen to have a prayer of dismissal and to uh, remember also the, our friends from Australia and the fire? All right, let's, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. O Jesus, through the Immaculate Heart of Mary, I offer you all my prayers, works, joys, and sufferings of this day, for all the intentions of thy sacred heart, in union with the holy sacrifice of the Mass throughout the world, in reparation for our sins, for the intentions of all our associates, including the veterans and those that are at risk in, in Wales now because of the fire, for the intention of all our associates, and in particular for this month's special intentions, conversion of sinners, poor souls in purgatory, that we are kept awake so we're not sifted by Satan. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And amen again. And I will end this with one of our fans. You know, Greg, Greg is not usually one that's really big into Christian heavy metal. He loves uh, this particular uh, act that I'm getting ready to, to share tonight. Uh, she was at our last uh, conference there, uh, Donna Corey Gibson. Uh, she's yeah, she got has a, a lovely voice. beautiful voice. Yeah. Oh, she does. And uh, she does these rock ballads that I like, too. You know, the Stations of the Cross uh, that she does when you listen to them individually. And, they, you know, I'll put them on my website, uh, my my. Uh, uh, Facebook page, every, you know, and you could actually see, but uh, you go to uh, Facebook and you go all the way from 1 to 14, 15, I think there's actually 15, but for the 14 stations, and uh, I mean, you know, the 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 pictures that they put behind it, they, they take scenes from the Patch of the Christ, you know, they put all this kind of together to kind of go with their music, and it's just very powerful, and, uh, and so I'm going to play uh, the ninth station to follow with what we just did tonight. And so, Greg, God bless you. Enjoy your time with your uh, your uh, grandkids, your children, your grandkids down there in Florida. Enjoy getting out of that this cold weather that we have up here. <laughs> and, Judy, I know that uh, down there where you're at, uh, I know you still got some good weather there, right? It's pretty Yeah, I've pleasant. got the air conditioner running. <laughs> uh, yeah, so okay. yeah. Down there where she, where she's at, it's seventy degrees. It's a cold front, so I I, I can I know the deal. Well, God bless you both, and uh, we will look forward to the next time. Next time we talk this particular show here, I should be already moved into my uh, our new home. It's a Victorian style home. It's uh, three stories with a basement. The basement looks like a catacomb. Wow. Uh, uh, it's uh, beautiful, built in 1903. Oh. You know, I was just uh, oh, a lot beautiful. Of history. Uh, the oh. the history about it, uh, uh, you know, just it was built in 1903, but just 50 years before that, Saint uh, Deshane, she was from uh, she was a Catholic nun who came and helped out the Potawatomi Indians uh, in Sugar Creek. Not Missouri, but Sugar Creek, Kansas, which is about 30 miles from where I'm at here. But just the history here, the plains and everything, very yeah. interesting. And in our the yeah. home that we have, it just kind of ties us into that history, beautiful mm. history. If you ever watched the old wagon train back in the old uh, in the old days, it was here that they would go from here to the Oregon Trail, or they would go to California. Or they would go down towards uh, Santa Fe, you know, down in Arizona land. 
So was it here, Missouri was called the like Gateway the, to the West? To the, yeah, with St. Louis, well, exactly. It, 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 it was, yeah, more but, more St. Joseph, yes. more St. Joseph, Missouri. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, and from there that's they where they really here. Yeah, that's where all your yeah, so. uh, big comp- big companies at the time they. Uh, they settled in St. Joseph, the ones that made the wagons, the ones that made everything that they would need on the trail, you know, uh-huh. the big time. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I remember the old yeah, Western show, Wagon Train. I used to love that show. <laughs> oh, I still like it. I still love that show. Uh, Chris Hale, well, the, I love Donald Chris Hale. And, and the ninth station that you're getting ready to play, that's... Uh, when Jesus fell the third third time, and uh-huh. uh, exactly it should it should every time we do the stations help us to think about every time we fall and those that are put into our path that we all the way to death that we get up and come back to Jesus every time we fall and help others do the same. Yes, yes. amen. Amen, amen. And so, without no further ado. The Stations of the Cross, the Ninth Station, Donna Corey Gibson. Good night, everybody. Good night, everyone. God bless you. Good night.